Good day. Christ has risen, and in this Easter season, it's good to focus on that. I hope Easter has been a time of reflection and rejoicing for everyone. And our passage today about the resurrection is Romans chapter 6, verses 1 to 11. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Well, don't you know that all of us who were baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he can't die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. In the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. I didn't grow up in a church-going family and rarely attended before I was about 15 and started attending Fairfield Baptist Church. My mother returned to her faith when I was about 10. My father was negative about Christianity until late in his life. But it was he who explained Easter to me when I was about five. It must have been hard for an agnostic and I checked his answer with mum. He said that Jesus was a good man who challenged the authorities and like the philosopher Socrates was killed except that Socrates took poison and Jesus was crucified. Dad wasn't sure about the resurrection but said that was what Easter Sunday was about. How did you learn about Easter? The Gospels' central events are Jesus' death and the resurrection. Let's focus today on the fact that he returned bodily to life on the third day after his crucifixion. Christ has risen, the Orthodox declare on Easter Sunday. Truly he is risen, they reply. St Paul reminds the Romans of the importance of Jesus' resurrection. He said, don't you know that all of us who were baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we've been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. Be clear on this though, it's not water that unites you with Christ's death and resurrection. It's the faith associated with baptism in the Holy Spirit which does this, a faith we express in water baptism. John the Baptist said of Jesus, I baptise with water, but he will baptise with the Holy Spirit and with fire. What do you really think about the resurrection? Does talk about bodily resurrection seem incredible? Scepticism can leave us saying, I know what I should believe, but how can someone really die and return again to life? Be honest about your doubts. When we live in a lie, how can we escape? Better an honest agnostic than a dishonest Christian. But people in Jesus' day were just as difficult to persuade about resurrection. When Paul preached in the Areopagus in Athens, they thought he was babbling about a god named Jesus and a goddess named Anastasia because Anastasia literally means resurrection. Surely Paul couldn't mean someone had actually risen from the dead. Yes, they knew about resuscitation, but not after two or three days. They knew when a body might not be fully dead and when it was beyond rescue. Or do you think the Greeks were too wise and sophisticated to be tricked? Do you think they were philosophers and thinkers? 
It was Galilean peasants and fishermen who believed stories about resurrection. Don't overrate the Greeks. They made great strides in philosophy, but they generally preferred debating to investigating real life. Practical experiments are much more Jewish and Christian than Greek. So, if anything, Jewish peasants were more sceptical about claims of things like resurrection. In fact, poor people are often more sceptical, more doubting than the wealthy, the educated. People at the bottom understand exploitation, understand being lied to, to get them acting against their own best interests. Of course, loudmouth populists can exploit scepticism, but used properly, it can be very valuable. The Jews Jesus and his disciples lived among, their own people, lived daily with birth, sickness, death. They lived in one room, parents and children together. They knew real life. Without good reasons, they wouldn't believe someone came back to life. They knew death. They'd pulled the bloated bodies of fishermen out of Galilee after a storm or had nursed parents with putrefying cancers and children dying from cuts that a tetanus shot or course of penicillin would cure today. Paul tells the Romans, all of us who were baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised to his death. If we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. The Romans too knew death. Life for ordinary Romans was nasty, brutish and short. Either Jesus had returned to life in a history-shaking unwinding of death, or he remained dead and the story was a fraud. They proposed no fanciful stories to oppose Paul's message. It either happened or it didn't. Paul was writing in about 55 to 57 AD about events 25 to 30 years earlier. What happened in Australia 30 years ago in 1992? Paul Keating was Prime Minister. George H.W. Bush became the first US President to address the Australian Parliament. Victor Chang's murderers were convicted and imprisoned. Jeff Kennett became Victoria's Premier. The Greens couldn't get Keating to act on global warming and decided to form a political party. Your memory didn't need much jogging to bring those things back, did it? If you were old enough to remember 30 years back, of course. I can spin tales about World War I, though. There were Roman Christians who had heard about the resurrection within months of its happening. Maybe some had even been in Jerusalem at the very time of these events. Uh, the darkness over the earth, the earthquake, the torn curtain. Did you know that geologists have found traces of what was probably that earthquake? Did you know that Jewish history tells that earthquake damage to the temple forced the Sanhedrin to meet in a temple storeroom or that the lintel above the curtain cracked? Real events hadn't faded into the mists of the past, forgotten and replaced with made-up resurrection stories people wished had happened. If the Gospels were written a century or more after the crucifixion, that would have been a possibility. But Mark possibly wrote even before the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Mark was probably about 15 when Jesus went to the cross and about 35 when Paul wrote to Rome. Even the other witnesses were still comparatively young. Peter was about 55. Paul was about 46. Jesus' mother Mary was still alive and maybe 70. And Mary Magdalene in her mid to late 40s. Even if they didn't write about it themselves, the people who saw Jesus crucified were the same people who told the gospel writers what they saw. And they were also around to correct someone like Paul if he got it wrong. The original witnesses were well able to recall the events. Something life-transforming had happened. It was neither comfortable nor easily explained away. They'd all seen Jesus die, crucified and speared by the centurion, knew Pilate and made sure he was dead. But this same Jesus was gone from the tomb. And Mary Magdalene and Mary Magdalene 
Jesus' mother and Mary, the wife of Clopas, and then Peter and John and Thomas and all the apostles saw him alive. You, you know I have an interest in history. I've studied a lot of history, uh, two years at university, four years at theological college, and a lot of reading. I'm a believer. But let's step back from that and consider the evidence. No historian can definitely say Jesus rose from the dead. But trying to be an historian, I'm persuaded that something incredible happened that first Easter. First, Jesus definitely died by crucifixion. It's among the best attested facts of history. Four gospel writers, Paul, Peter, the, the Jewish historian Josephus, the Roman historian Tacitus were all close enough to the events to have left as good evidence for Jesus' crucifixion and death as for just about anyone in antiquity. Second, there were significant events when he died. An earthquake, a darkening of the sun at a time when an eclipse is impossible, tombs were broken open, the temple sustained significant damage. Third, in the early morning of the third day, when the women went back to the tomb, they couldn't find Jesus' body. And finally, numbers of people, certainly over 15 at one time, were convinced that they saw Jesus, that they could touch him, that he had holes in his arms and side from the crucifixion. Paul says that over 500 saw the risen Jesus at the same time. I can say all of that. But thinking as an historian, I can't say that he did rise from the dead. But I'm not here as an historian, I'm here as a preacher. Uh, my task is to tell you to reflect on the facts and make up your mind. Did Jesus actually rise again or not? And I can tell you my belief that at the crisis points of my life, the living Jesus was at work. When I was called into ministry, I was told that was where I had to go. Quite unlike any idea I had ever had for my life. Jesus spoke to me. When he told me it was time to begin training, events worked together to make it happen. And I saw the hand of Jesus in it all. When the church was nearly bankrupted and there was no solution, a word came to give me an unexpected answer which turned everything around. I can't prove historically that Jesus is alive, but I can testify that through faith in Jesus, I'm now in contact with God in a way I couldn't have been without him. The American author John Updike wrote a poem, Seven Stanzas Upon Easter. He says, Make no mistake. If he rose again, it was as his body. If the cell's dissolution didn't reverse, the molecules re-knit, the amino acids rekindle, the church will fall. The resurrection is no springtime myth, no symbolic way of discussing the Holy Spirit. Don't imagine a spiritual resurrection, whatever that means. Updike insists that Jesus rose in the flesh with thumbs, toes, knuckles, a heart that paused and then regained its strength. He says that all of our use of terms like parable, metaphor, analogy are effectively ways of mocking God or in suggesting that people in earlier ages credulously accepted any old story, we mock them. It was a real stone that was rolled back the stone that will eventually cut off the light from our lives too, just as the angel at the tomb was a real angel, solid, palpable, wearing real linen from an identifiable loom, according to Updike. The resurrection is monstrous in Updike's terms, but it's not for us to beautify it for our own comfort. There are many reasons to believe that Jesus rose bodily from the dead. That doesn't make it any easier to believe what none of us has ever experienced. But ultimately, each of us must decide, because as Paul wrote even earlier, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ hasn't been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, 
we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he didn't raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. Jesus' resurrection is history's most momentous event. If it occurred, and I'm convinced it did, then so much that we think important becomes trivial. Who cares what we wear to church or what songs we sing? Christ has risen, and our lives are lived in the beginning of the final resurrection. Who cares whether we seem strange to the world around us? Christ has risen, and our lives are lived in the beginning of the final resurrection. But also, if Christ has risen, so much that we barely consider suddenly becomes important. Do we reject refugees? Do we assess people's value by their class, by their sexuality, by their cleanliness? Or do we believe that a risen Christ transforms everything? Do we protect our reputation, our position, our wealth above all else? Or do we trust that a risen Christ is Lord of all these things? Do we little by little give up on the church and decide that religion will die out in our lifetimes? Or do we believe that a risen Jesus can raise up his church to new life? If Christ has risen, the resurrection has begun and we've started living in it. Jesus says, look, I'm making everything new. What do you decide about the resurrection? May Jesus, the risen Lord, reveal himself to our hearts and understanding today. Christ is risen. Truly, he is risen. Amen. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe using the button below.